in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Ave Maria Purissima. So today I'll continue the reflection we began last time on the Our Father. We covered the first part. And to note that, that the, first thing we des- the first thing we do is lift up our eyes to heaven, to our Father who art in heaven. Then of petitions we first desire that his name be hallowed and blessed, that his kingdom come, that his will be done. And only then do we make our petitions for what we need. So note uh, the perfect ordering of charity within us. Charity, that virtue by which we love God for his own sake and our neighbor and ourself for the sake of God. And this is an important point that uh, the Catechism makes, that we can ask for our material needs, right? God wants to provide them to us, but we should acknowledge that they are from him. And we might even receive them in abundance, insofar as our uh, intentions are ordered towards the hallowing of his name, the extension of his kingdom, the fulfilling of his will. And thus, uh, Mother Teresa, for example, was one to say that, that God has plenty of money. She was never lacking. She'd receive large donations whenever she needed something. And because God knew that that would go and be employed to the extension of his kingdom here on earth. So, or with our intentions rightly ordered, then do we ask, we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, we begin with the word bread in Latin, panem nostrum. And uh, what is meant by bread? St. Jerome, who translates this uh, adjective, daily bread, uh, in one place translates this as quotidianum, as daily, and another place is super substantial, right? that which is uh, uh, sufficient for every day, and even uh, more than what we need. And so, but we can understand in that word super substantial that it's above even our natural substance and that we refer here first and foremost to our spiritual bread, right? As man does not live on bread alone, right? That uh, we need first uh, the word of God. We need the faith. We need our Lord himself and the most blessed sacrament. As he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. We'll hear in the uh, communion antiphon today, the bread which I will give is my life is my flesh for the life of the world. And so that should be, that reminds us that our deepest longing, right, what our soul longs for most, our uh, our restless heart, is not at rest until it rests in Him. And no, practically, right, that's why the Church makes us fast before the reception of Holy Communion. It used to be from midnight onwards, so that the first uh, food that you would receive each day would be our blessed Lord. And we should feel those pangs of hunger and direct them towards him. And I will just comment here practically that I propose to you to try to go to Mass every day that you can. As a convert, when I learned the truth of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, as, uh, at the end of high school, I started going to Mass every day. I had a car already, so before high school, go to daily Mass. And I've kept that practice ever since. Even on my day off, I love to celebrate Mass, and I can't imagine going a day without receiving our Lord in Holy Communion. And that uh, put me on the straight and narrow, gave me so many graces of my vocation, etc. And so, speaking from my personal experience, it's, again, the greatest moment of every day is to be able to receive our Lord. We have examples, too, of laity, St. Louis, King of France, with all the affairs of the kingdom to manage, at the same time, went to Mass every day. St. Isidore the Farmer, with all the labors of his field, likewise, uh, always went to Mass. And so I propose that for your imitation. Notice how we say, likewise, it's uh, bread for what we need, of our material needs. But here we note uh, that our Lord adds, uh, in repetition really, uh, give us this day our daily bread. So a double reference to it just being daily. Why is this? Well, our Lord knows, obviously, that uh, when we go to pray to to him, we often want him to get, uh, we want all that we are worried about, right, we would often like him to give us more than just our daily bread. If he could give us all the bread we need for this month, for this year, just make me rich, Lord, and I won't have to come back and bother you so often, right? Just, right? Because we don't want to worry, right? We want to see, to walk by sight rather than faith. So no, doubly, he says, daily bread, that we should, as we heard yet, uh, last Sunday in the Gospel, Consider the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, how God provides for them. 
that uh, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, right? That we should live day by day and trust in God's providence. Because that's the whole point of our life, again, is to trust in his providence, right? To live in that constant dependency on him. The whole purpose of God in creating us is to show forth his glory. And he does that by being our benefactor. But he does that when we acknowledge that we need him. And that's why he asks us to come back every day. We glorify him by acknowledging him uh, as, as our daily bread. And likewise, um, our Lord says, you know, how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? I've often observed it. People with uh, great abundance often forget about God, right? Dependency on God. See, if I want something, I just go buy it. I'm self-sufficient. I can do it myself, right? That's the great lie. That's the lie of Satan. Uh, we'll be like God without God. So we ask for our daily bread. At the same time, uh, trusting in God's providence, living day by day, which in the end helps us often be more focused and efficient in providing and gaining our daily bread. Our Lord also uh, commands us to be prudent, right? If we're going out to a battle, to take account if, if we're able to wage that war. And as a uh, loving father in his providence, he who sees the future, so too the father of the family is likewise planning ahead. It is the uh, motto of Christendom, really, right? That the St. Benedict gave us and which built uh, Catholic Western civilization, pray and work, right? Not just pray, but to work as well. And as St. Ignatius said, to pray as if everything depended on God and to work as if everything depended on you. Acknowledging that even your ability to work is first from him. And so we ask for our daily bread, uh, both spiritually and materially. <clears throat> Likewise, then we add, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So please note here as the, as the church uh, underlines that we, are, are, that we ask for forgiveness from our offenses, debts, trespasses, to the degree that just as right, we forgive those who offend us, who trespass against us. Our Lord tells us, if you will forgive men their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you also your offenses, if, it's a conditional clause, right? According to the measure that we measure others, we will be measured as well. And what sense does it have, right? If we're here at the foot of the cross, asking our Lord to forgive us of our sins, right? And we refuse to apply that to those who have offended us. We're at the foot of the cross, right? Our Lord is saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. Is that part of your prayer as well? And if it's not, you know, what hypocrisy we should accuse ourselves of. And perhaps we even feel unworthy that we shouldn't pray this prayer. How can I put those words on my lip? I'm not ready to forgive my neighbor who's offended me. Hear the words of St. Albert, who says, if, even if someone guards ill will towards the one who has wronged him, he should not be advised not to say the Our Father. Rather, let him say it in the person of the church who forgives the sins of all, and let him say it with groaning, that our Lord may soften his heart, that he may forgive. Say it with groaning, that our Lord may soften his heart. For it often happens that in saying this very prayer, sinners are converted, and forgive, they, uh, forgive that they may be forgiven. Again, you decide your own judgment, right? How merciful will our Lord be to you, according to the measure you measure others, you also will be measured. Then we pray, and lead us not into temptation. Here the Greek refers to, uh, can be understood as, do not allow us to enter into temptation, or do not let us yield to temptation. The Roman Catechism explains these words as we could get the wrong idea that God might lead us into temptation towards sin. First, uh, the Roman Catechism says, quoting St. James, let no man, when he is tempted, say that he is tempted of God, for God is not a tempter of evils. Okay? God is not inclining us to sin in any way. But secondly, it says, we are said to be led into temptation by him who, although he himself does not tempt us, nor cooperate in tempting us, yet is said to tempt because he does not prevent us from being tempted, or from being overcome by temptations when he is able to prevent these things. In this manner, God indeed suffers the good and the pious to be tempted, but does not leave them unsupported by his grace. Okay, and that's the important point. Again, 
big picture here, it's the whole purpose of our freedom, right? Why didn't God, even the angels, he didn't establish them in the beatific vision from the first moment of their existence, much less Adam and Eve. We all have to go through a trial, a test in this life, so as to prove that we love God above all things, right? That's the purpose of our life. That's why he gives us freedom and why uh, we, ha we are tempted by other goods in this world so that we might show that we love God, the supreme good, above all. And so that's the usefulness to temptation. As scripture says, blessed is the man who suffers temptation. Blessed. For once he shall have been proved, he will receive the eternal recompense. And again, God is the model for you as parents too. He is not the proverbial helicopter mom, right? Which just tries to prevent every possible temptation from coming into the lives of their children. It's different stages, right? When the roots are tender, you take greater care, etc. But again, the end is that they go out as soldiers of Christ into the world, right? That's where our Lord sent us. We're not hiding from the world. We're going out into it to convert it. That is the last uh, mandate that he gave us, that you not fail in, in, uh, in living it. And so we see that God uh, allowed Satan, right? Even into the garden with our first parents. He allowed Satan to approach Job, as we're reading now in the Matins readings in the Divine Office. He allowed him to tempt his dearly beloved son, right? And all of that is a test. I encourage you to read, again, the prophet Job or St. Gregory's commentary on that uh, great work of Scripture. Uh, so much to learn. Um, but again, the point is, by the temptation, by the test, we grow in our love of God, right? We grow in love by the fight not by, uh, not by rest or the lack of temptation. Again, it's, uh, many are thought to be virtuous, but it's not proven. Right? It's only, it needs to be proven to be, to be true virtue, which refers to a strength, a power of the soul. Likewise, uh, quotes St. James, who says, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. You will always, my grace is sufficient for thee. Virtue is made perfect in weakness. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's why St. Augustine says at times feels like we're not strengthened. That's when we're called to pray more fervently, to be strengthened. Sit our Lord too in his agony in the garden, right? And his soul is sad unto death. He goes back to pray more earnestly. And what did he say to the apostles on this, uh, on this occasion? Again, so as not to fall into temptation, Pray and watch. Watch ye and pray that ye enter not into temptation. And consider this. So, and, and there's many, and there's so many other parables of our Lord about uh, being, uh, keeping vigil, watching, waiting, being awake for his arrival, right? That we're always looking towards. And note, and this is always something to think of, the apostles, right? The three uh, most beloved apostles, Peter, James, and John, who were with our Lord at his transfiguration, Again, this, they saw and heard so much more than what's in the gospel, right? All that our Lord said and did, which wouldn't fill all the books of the world, as St. John says, they saw that constantly for three years. And then one night that they prayed, that they failed to watch and pray, they abandoned our Lord. They didn't have the grace that they needed to be faithful in that moment of temptation because they did not watch and pray. So all the more does it apply to us who know our Lord uh, much less, much more imperfectly. We have to watch and pray. The, the grace of tomorrow might depend on saying yes to the grace of today. And then we pray, but deliver us from evil. The Catechism comments this petition with which the Son of God concludes this divine prayer, embodies the substance of all the other petitions. So think about this. This is the prayer that you say through the server or you've sing in response, uh, this is your part because it sums up everything else that the priest has prayed, uh, modeling how the Son of God taught it to the apostles. It says, to show its force and importance, our Lord made use of this petition when on the eve of his passion, he prayed to God his Father for the salvation of mankind, right? Praying not to take them from the world, but to, uh, but to give them the grace that they need. And, uh, and he has uh, epitomized, as it were, the meaning and spirit of all the other petitions. For if we obtain what this petition asks, that is, the protection of God against evil, which enables us to stand secure and safe against the machinations of the world and the devil, then, as St. Cyprian remarks, 
nothing more remains to be asked. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, and again through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. And then we close our prayer with the word Amen. Again, we have uh, the languages consecrated by the cross of Christ. So you see the I-N-R-I, right? That's Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This is also written in Greek and also written in Hebrew, right? Those are the three sacred languages we've used uh, from apostolic times for uh, the sacred liturgy. Uh, the, all the ancient liturgies celebrated in those tongues. And in our Roman liturgy, which we receive from Jerusalem, right? Uh, we have uh, those languages, those languages as well, still in it, right? So we say words in Greek, uh, like uh, Eucharist, for example, and words in Hebrew, like Alleluia and Amen. So here, uh, the Roman Catechism notes, in the sacrifice of the Mass, when the Lord's Prayer is said, she does not assign the word Amen to the server. Right? So who responds on your behalf? Think about this. When all the other prayers of the collect, post communion, I say per omnia secula seculorum, you say amen, right? Here the faithful don't say amen. This is a curious exception. She reserves it as appropriate to the priest himself, who as mediator between God and man answers amen, thus intimating that God has heard the prayers of his people. This practice, however, is not common to all the prayers, but it's peculiar to the Lord's Prayer. Right? Because in every other, this word only expresses assent and desire. And that's the two senses of the word amen. We can use it as so be it, or we can use it as an affirmative. Like we translate, verily, verily, I say to you. Amen, amen, I say to you that it is so. Here pronounced in the person of Christ, the priest says, it is so. Your prayer has been heard, because what we've just offered is the most perfect prayer which the Father cannot deny as it came from the lips of his divine Son. As the Catechism concludes, saying, Nor can anyone doubt that God is moved by the name of his Son, and by a word so often uttered by him, who, as the Apostle says, was always heard for his reverence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.